When we think of what the power of belief means, here in the real world at least, we think of more nuanced and subtle themes. Hope, willpower, and personal strengths are all things that will usually come to mind. We use belief and spirituality to help carry us through our day-to-day, -day, as well as guide our morality and decision-making. On rare occasions, we see more extreme uses of belief in the manipulation of groups of people, resulting in harmful or cult-like behavior patterns. Despite all this, spirituality and belief is never reflected in outward expressions of power like we see in World of Warcraft. While there are many religions, belief systems, and just as many deities or half-gods, today we'll be focusing on two polar opposite systems. These two contending sources of spiritual power seem entirely antithetical to each other, but could it be that, in fact, the light and the shadow are simply two sides of the same coin with different sources but so well aligned that they're more like a law of nature than anything else? Welcome to Ancient Lore, a discussion series where we peel back the layers of world building and story to examine, understand, and discuss where we came from in the world of Warcraft. Today's topic is the light and the shadow. And as always, if you have any comments or questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below or connect with me on my Discord. Let's set our parameters for today, and thankfully enough, today will be very easy in this regard. There really is no piece of lore we need to not consider in this case, as pretty much everything written on Light and Shadow has at least something to do with what we'll be talking about today. While I may not like the later lore in Azoth in particular, there's nothing I find disagreeable with anything written about the Light, even how absolutely bonkers the Naru actually are. While I'm not going to be referencing anything from the novels or a lot from more recent expansions, I'm not going to begrudge anyone wanting to discuss these points in the comments or afterwards. Let's dig in to the origins of the power of the light and shadow. Our first documented records of both light and shadow magic come from the religious leaders for each faction in Warcraft 1, the clerics and necrolite units respectively. Clerics could use the light to both heal and harm others, and Necrolites could use the shadow to inflict damage, imbue allies with unholy strength, and raise the dead. This is also our introduction to the very antithetical nature that light and shadow have to each other. While they both are utilized by spiritual faction leaders to empower their people, they do so in very different ways. We see a much bigger and more distinct divide between the two disciplines in Warcraft 2, with Paladins becoming the primary healers and practitioners of the Light for the Alliance, and Death Knights coming onto the field as the resurrected souls of Necrolites implanted in the corpses of dead Stormwind Knights, decrepit brothers of the horse forced back into service. Paladins are very upfront and to the point, even able to use the Light to expel the undead from our existence. With Death Knights, we see a much wider and more varied spell selection, a vast expansion of power, and giving us a much deeper understanding of what power the Shadow has available to it. Death Coil is our first introduction to the vampiric nature of Shadow Magic and what it can do at times, and Death and Decay is a new level of mastery and control, exerting an immense amount of necrotic power over an area. While Death and Decay is written as a continuation of the Poison Cloud ability from Warlocks from Warcraft 1, each spell comes from different sources and different elements, and I believe that they should be considered separate entities when you consider the direction Death and Decay and Shadow Magic in general takes in later games and expansions. The antithetical nature of Light and Shadow is much more heavily emphasized in Warcraft 2 with the balance between Paladin's Exorcism and Death Knight's Raise Dead. Where the Horde raises undead warriors, Paladins are brought in to obliterate them from this realm of existence with the Light. This is a vital point, reflected directly later on in the Ashbringer event from TBC in the Caverns of Time. The Light and Shadow are truly opposite sides of a mathematical equation, when you have a strong source of one, you can directly counteract it with applications of the other until both neutralize each other utterly. Warcraft 3 gives us two major critical details when it comes to the relationship between Light and Shadow, the first being the fall of Prince Arthas. Trained in the ways of the Silver Hand, Arthas was raised to be the best the Order had to offer, a prince destined to be a king that would use the morality and strength that comes from being a fully trained paladin 
to lead Lordaeron into a greater age of prosperity. The shadow is insidious, vile, and more than anything else, all corrupting. And Ner'zhul's whispers to Arthas as he ventured into Northrend on his quest for revenge against the Dreadlord Mal'Ganis were especially effective. The Lich King tapped into the pride and anger deep inside Arthas, manipulating him into further acts of depravity until he took up the Runeblade Frostmourne and cast aside everything he held dear for power. The symbolism in a paladin being corrupted by shadows so utterly that he morphed into a Death Knight cannot be understated. His soul, stolen by the weapon that promised him so much power, his mastery of the light converted into shadow-powered unholy skills, and his righteous hammer discarded for a rune shadow blade. Truly, in Arthas, more than anyone else, we see how the opposing forces of light and shadow can affect someone, and how their power can be expressed. In addition, and speaking of the polarity between Death Knights and Paladins in general in Warcraft 3, uh, we have to speak about the differences between the abilities Holy Light and Death Coil. Holy Light, as you would expect, heals a friendly living target, but now it can also damage a nearby undead target, combining the effect of exorcism into its spell cast. Death Coil does the exact opposite, healing a friendly undead target, but harming a living target. The levels of power on these abilities are almost exactly the same as well, each being a direct reflection of each other. Rarely do we get such a powerful set of symbols to express the duality of light and shadow, but we don't stop there. Let's do a rare jump forward in time to the Burning Crusade. Many will fondly remember the original debut of the Caverns of Time, with two instances and later on a raid that takes us back in time to see key moments and prevent a corrupt bronze flight from destroying time itself. We won't recount everything in the Caverns of Time for this, as we just need a small moment from the Escape from Durnhold instance. Taking place in the Hillsbrad foothills just before Warcraft 3, during the instance, you can head over to the town of South Shore, see a lot of notable people and hear some interesting details and conversations. If you're patient, you can watch an event that tells us so much about that antithetical nature that binds Light and Shadow together that I continue to reference. In the South Shore Tavern, we see many of the founders of the Scarlet Crusade, still members of the Church of the Light and the Silver Hand, with Commander Mograine at the head of the table. He removes a crystal of pure shadow from a small chest, commenting he took it from a dead orc shadowcaster at Blackrock Spire during the Second War, and warns everyone that no one should touch it as it corrupts anything it comes in contact with. Mograine continues, that if this pure manifestation of shadow exists, the same kind of manifestation of the light must also exist, and adds this is because they're polar opposites. As Asilian and Tyrion attempt to purge the shadow crystal with the light, it actively absorbs the light magic, eventually inverting the crystal into a manifestation of the light, healing Commander Mograine's hand and becoming the source of power in the legendary sword Ashbringer. This specific event, more than anything else, shows us that while the light and shadow are polar opposites and opposing forces to each other, they operate on the same level of existence, being entirely tuned to each other. This, along with how Naru operate in almost the exact same way as the light and shadow crystal, fuel my theory that, while both disciplines are powered by an individual's belief in them, that both are actually more like laws of nature like gravity. That sounds a bit bonkers, sure, but let's look at another example. The old gods are beings fueled by the shadow, eager to corrupt and consume anything they possibly can, but they don't worship or pray at any altar. The old gods are the gods that they believe should be worshipped, and yet they utilize the full onslaught of shadow powers that only the most powerful beings could possibly use. Sure, a priest's belief in the light will help them reach greater heights of power, but compared to a being like an old god who's got a truly complete understanding of how to call the shadow, that's a drop in the bucket. We see this also in the Naru, beings made of pure light that can speak through calming musical tones and telepathy. 
They have no belief in a higher power or greater being, but instead have a deep and complex understanding of the light and how to use its power, so much greater than any mortal or adventurer could ever even get close to. On top of that, you drain the light from Inaru, and they eventually become a corrupted shadow-infused reflection of their former selves. There is no belief that fuels this change, just the mathematical energy levels inside the Naru itself. We also see this expressed in gameplay in World of Warcraft. A priest can choose a light-based approach using holy magic that they call down, or they can assume a shadow form, restricting them from using holy spells of any kind, but empowering their shadow magic to flay and destroy with greater effectiveness. A fun side note, is the concept of words of power that priests have access to, reinforcing this humorously ironic concept that words truly do have power when it comes to World of Warcraft priests. Whether it's to shield or embolden the body, or a whisper of death and pain, the concept of empowered speech keeps coming back over and over again in World of Warcraft and anyone who uses the lighter shadow. This brings us to probably one of the biggest questions in these disciplines, however, which is, where exactly does light and shadow magic come from? What, what's its source? With arcane magic, it's ley lines that course like veins through existence. Fell magic comes from the twisting nether and empowers the demons that reside there. Shamanism is an expression of elemental power, and druidic nature magic is the magic of the essence of life, a good example of this being the Emerald Dream. So, where do light and shadow come from? In later lore, from Legion and BFA specifically, we hear about this shimmering sea of light and the Void Lords. While this isn't the worst lore ever written, it's not the best for this discussion. So, I'm going to dial it back slightly in an effort to frame my theory appropriately. To state it clearly, by the way, my theory is this. The light and shadow are not just antithetical powers, but are a singular type of natural force in the universe, like gravity or electromagnetism. We're well aware of how light and shadow are polar opposites, not only have I proved that in references as many times, but also many other sources have this well documented. Yes, belief in these disciplines does enhance a mortal's ability to be a conduit for light and shadow. However, this rule can be easily bent. Their source is not anything supernatural or otherworldly, but quite the opposite. The source of the light and shadow is existence itself, and is the major reason why any belief or faith can pull from them either as they like. The key is not what you believe in, but that you believe in something. And the stronger your faith in that and yourself, the more it can enhance that power, at least with us mortals. I'd be curious if a mortal could shed that need for belief or faith in some way and pull from the light or shadow in the way a Naru or old god could. But the ability to do that may be part of their nature and not something that can be taught to a mortal. Certainly, this is more theory crafting than Loctite lore, and early, think Wrath of the Lich King and beforehand, world building is very muddied when it comes to where we draw magic from. The Sunwell may be the best example of that, originally portrayed in Warcraft 2 and 3 as a font of holy power that the High Elves worshipped, but later retconned to be a source of arcane power. That power stemmed from a vial of essence from the original Well of Eternity, but that's a subject we're gonna get into another time as it brings up a whole slew of new questions to ask. No matter how you view them, the powers of light and shadow have had an immense impact on the Warcraft universe and will continue to be a staple as long as the games exist. In a future episode, we'll dig into other spiritual disciplines and religions, discussing their strengths and sources of power, and try to gain a better understanding of their meaning for the peoples that follow them. We close this book of Warcraft history here and save the rest for another time. If you've enjoyed this feature, please consider subscribing here at youtube.com slash the Dan Nation, as well as joining my Discord at tinyurl.com slash danscord. It's a Discord, but with 100% more Dan. A big thank you to Turtle Wow, where most of the visual footage you see during this episode was recorded at, as well as having provided the backing track for this piece. 
From the Lore Bunker here in Boston, Massachusetts, this is Dan wishing you a wonderful and wide, wide world of lore.